Good morning, church family. Welcome to our worship for today. To begin our call to worship, I'd like to invite us to reflect on a question. What is it for you that you look to for meaning or for purpose in life? What do you strive after to give you a sense of worth, a sense of value? All of us in our life, we strive after things that we hope will give us a meaning in our lives, we hope will give us validation. But when we remember God's word and we remember what God has done for us through Jesus Christ, it's at that point where we're able to recognize that only God can truly give us our meaning in life and that he's the only one that we could truly shelter in to give us abundant life. And so from Psalm chapter 63, verses one to three, David writes, O oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faint, uh, faints for you, as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary beholding your power and glory. Because your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you. So as we begin our worship with singing songs of praise to God, let us remember that he is our one true love and our one true life. Let's pray. Lord, you truly are the only one who gives us our worth, our value, your love, is truly better than life. And God, may we continue to submit our lives to you. May we continue to submit our dreams to you, Lord, so that we can find our worth and our life in you, God. Lord, you are worth it all. And so we give it all to you this morning. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's begin today's worship with some songs of praise.
I stand in wonder of the sacrifice you made. Mercy be your measure.
liked and loved by everyone. Approval that outshines the sun. Cheered by all. Good morning, brothers and sisters. Praise God that we can worship together online on this Sunday morning. I'd like to dedicate the following time to pray for the minister of the church as well as the pandemic around the world. Let's bow and have a word of prayer together. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for your loving kindness and your mercy. They are new every morning and great is your faithfulness. And Father, we come before you to worship you. And may you accept our worship with gladness. And Father, we pray especially for the situation around the world, for the pandemic. And Father, we pray for a lot of places. They are suffering severely as well as not having enough vaccines. And Father, we pray especially for India, for the situation. And Father, may your mercy be upon them and upon everyone uh, on this planet earth and father we do not know why but yet we believe in your goodness and believe that you are uh, loving and you are merciful and uh, father we pray that your will be done on earth as it is in heaven and father we pray that you will relieve this situation uh, soon and father we also pray that we can learn from the situation of the brevity of life, of how helpless we are, and how much more we need to rely on you. And Father, we also would like to pray for the transition, uh, knowing that uh, at least in the U.S., um, the schools are reopening and a lot of business are reopening and the people start going back to work. And Father, we pray for the transition, uh, pray for the kids, pray for their safety. And Father, we also would like to pray for the ministry of the church, especially pray for the reopening process and pray also for the various fellowship. Pray for the leaders, uh, the advisors. Um, pray that you continue to uh, reach out to the community and um, also give us wisdom as of how we could also care for our members. And Father, thank you again for this opportunity to pray and have full confidence that you will answer our prayer according to your goodwill. 
And Father, thank you, and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. I remember when I was uh, a teenager, late teen, um, maybe around like between 17 to, uh, 17 to 19, I've joined uh, a gospel singing group in Hong Kong. At that time, we uh, went around uh, to different churches or uh, community center uh, to sing uh, American folk songs, uh, actually gospel folk songs, uh, and share the gospel. And I remember one song in particular uh, that is our favorite. The name is called I Looked for Love. It talked about uh, the person trying to look for love in nature and trying to look for love among people in religion, but yet got disappointed. And in fact, it is true that a lot of times we think that we can get the answer in the world, maybe through uh, looking for love, maybe in the world, looking for satisfaction, but yet quite often we will feel disappointed. I remember reading a little one line, um, one liner. It says, my wife and I are inseparable. In fact, Last week, it took four state troopers and a dog. You know what it means? Like, they're inseparable not because they're so um, in love with one another, but that you know, they probably engage in a fight or something that need four state troopers and one dog to separate them. Disappointing. Today, we'll continue our topic a discussion on counterfeit shelters. And I'd like to introduce one counterfeit shelter to you. And um, somehow, in fact, that many people got trapped by this counterfeit shelter. And today we try to understand what it is um, and somehow why people got trapped and in what way that we could have a breakthrough. Um, in fact, this is the, the Sherman title, Counterfeit Shelter 2, Romance, Love, Marriage, and Sex. Well, sometimes it is very dis uh, difficult to distinguish whether this is in fact um, a counterfeit shelter. Uh, why? Because basically there's nothing wrong with romance, love, marriage, and sex. Uh, it's not something that is bad, but in fact, if you read the Bible, you find out the truth about, about romance, about love, about marriage, and about sex. In Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 5, it says, When a man is newly married, he shall not go out with the army or be liable for any other public duty. He shall be free at home one year. To be happy with his wife, whom he has taken. After reading this, don't you want to be in the Old Testament? You know, when one get married, and he could have not only the honeymoon, but honeymoon, moon, 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 honeymoon year. In fact, for one year, this person uh, didn't have to go with the army, uh, didn't have to have uh, any uh, public duty. How nice it is. And in fact, this is the will of God that we enjoy our marriage. And Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 9, it says, Enjoy life with the wife whom you love all the days of your vain life that he has given you under the sun, because that is your portion in life and in your toil at which you toil under the sun. Remember Ecclesiastes was written by King Solomon. He pretty much had everything, but toward the end of his life, he is saying, oh, vanity is vanity. Everything is like blowing in the wind. It's just vanity and vanity. But yet, he's saying that even in this vain life, in this vain life under the sun, there's one thing important that you can enjoy 
enjoy life with the wife whom you love. So marriage is given by God for us to enjoy. Not only that, if you read further, Proverbs chapter 5, verse 18 to 19. It says, Rejoice in the wife of your youth. 19. Let her breast fill you at all times with delight. Be intoxicated always in her love. It's not talking about marriage or romance or uh, love. It's also talking about sex, of course, within the marriage. It says, Rejoice in the wife of your youth and let her breast fill you at all times with delight. So, romance, love, marriage, and sex are given by God for us to enjoy when we are under that umbrella of marriage. Then you can enjoy sex. And we're supposed to uh, really enjoy uh, our spouse, the time together. Even um, God is saying, hey, set aside time for one year. When you newly get married, uh, you need to develop your relationship with one another. And in fact, you see, the last sentence says, be intoxicated always in her love. No, what do you mean by be intoxicated? In fact, the word uh, or in the original language has been used to describe uh, something God led astray uh, or describe someone who's drunk, staggering, or oh, didn't know what, uh, where to go and, and something like that. That's why it's translated here in the ESV, be intoxicated always in her love. So we're supposed to enjoy the romance, enjoy the love, uh, engage in the marriage and marriage and also sex within the marriage. And this is given and blessed by God. Today's sermon title, Counterfeit Shelter 2, Romance, Love, Marriage, Sex. I think the very first thing we have to recognize is that these meaning romance, love, marriage, sex, are created by God for us to enjoy. Now, pretty much you get a sense of, oh, why it is so difficult to draw the line to say, oh yeah, um, this is good, this is bad, this is a counterfeit shelter, uh, this is not. Because romance, love, marriage, sex is basically, in this nature, it's nothing wrong, it's not bad. And on the other hand, it was created by God for us to enjoy. And so, if this is the case, then how can we avoid not to let originally what is good, what is enjoyable, what was created by God, do not let these things turn into counterfeit shelters. And first, we need to understand that romance, love, marriage, sex, cannot be the life bull in the storm of life. And sometimes we treat uh, these things as the life buoy and, and thinking, thinking that, oh, in, in the storm of life that I need to uh, grab onto this and then so that uh, I could be saved. No, don't shelter in these things. Uh, especially when you read the Bible. In John chapter 4, 17 to 18. Uh, remember the situation when Jesus was talking to the Samaritan woman, uh, talking about living water, talking about what is true worship. And the woman, and the woman answered him. He said, I, had no, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, Yeah, you're right in saying I have no husband. For you have had five husbands. And the one you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. You look at this lady. You know, having one husband cannot satisfy her. Two husbands or the second husband, the third husband, the fourth husband, the fifth husband, and now living with a person who is not her husband. 
But let's look at her life. She could not be fulfilled. Or maybe you would say, "Oh, maybe like it's just bad luck that the first husband died, second husband died, third husband died, fourth husband died, fifth husband died." But looking at her attitude, how she was afraid to see people, that's why uh, she has to come out to draw water in the noon time, the hottest time of the day. Uh, so, and also uh, how she responded. Uh, to other people and say, oh, you know, this man, Jesus, uh, talk about everything uh, of my life. So probably this is a adulterous woman, immoral woman. But having one man, two men, three, four, five, and now six did not satisfy her. She still need and want living water. So we have to realize that having romance, love, marriage, sex cannot bring ultimate satisfaction in our life. And quite often when we rely on these things to find satisfaction, we will be disappointed. I remember uh, a news in, in May 2012. At that time, um, a couple, the... Uh, visited or they, they, they travel to a game reserve in South Africa. A game reserve is a place that you can like see animals walking by and you can even touch and pet the animal. And this couple, they um, visited this game reserve uh, and in celebrating the wife's 60th birthday. So uh, they arrived and, uh, and they are engaged in the petting zoo to pet two cheaters. Like, um, it's a dangerous animal, but they were tamed. Uh, they were raised in the place, so it's supposed to be very safe. And after petting the cheaters, um, then they kept on uh, taking pictures uh, around that area. But at that moment, one of the cheaters um, somehow scratch or grab uh, the leg of an eight-year-old girl. Uh, and the woman, the wife, um, probably because of her nature, um, and she just protected the girl and, and tried to drive the cheetah away. But the girl ran away. But that was the time that the two cheater turned on to her in a savage attack. And then you know, it lasted for three minutes, uh, like the cheaters were like scratching her, biting her, and she was uh, on the ground and, and playing dead. If I want you to imagine, if you were the husband, what would you have done during that time? Probably look for a steak or something to try to chase away the cheaters and or uh, like even use the camera to swing, swing, swing or uh, take off the belt and then trying to chase the cheater away or try to uh, call for help. You know what that husband did? He kept on taking pictures of the attack. You know, just imagine three minutes. Three minutes is a long time. You want to try? You know, if I stop here for three minutes, you know, if I say one, one thousand, two, one thousand, three, one thousand, four, one thousand, count how many times? One hundred eighty times. It's a long time, especially when you are suffering, being attacked by a wild animal, by two wild and wild animals. But then, yeah, just can't imagine. How could the husband kept taking pictures? Uh, fortunately, uh, the wife was okay, even though like she has to have a lot of stitches on her skull, uh, on her leg, uh, and then she was bleeding on the neck, on the stomach. But she did not have life-threatening wounds. I don't know what will happen uh, after the trip. Or after the attack, I don't know how the husband could face the wife, and I don't know how many sorry apology that the husband had to make to explain why, you know, when the life was in danger, yet the husband was taking picture. Romance, 
love, marriage, and sex are at times disappointing. And cannot fulfill our deepest need. And the Bible gave a very good example. The example of Samson, the judge. If you read Judges chapter 14, verse 1 to 3, it says, Samson went down to Timnah, and at Timnah he saw one of the daughters of the Philistines. Verse 2, Then he came up and told his father and mother, I saw one of the daughters of the Philistines at Timnah. Now get her for me as my wife. But the father and mother said to him, Is there not a woman among the daughters of your relatives or among all our people that you must go to take a wife from the uncircumcised Philistines? But Samson said to his father, Get her from me, for she is right in my eyes. Just imagine, Samson saw a girl. And he said, get her for me, get her for me now. Can't you find any other one among the Jews? But she said, no, I like her. She is right in my eyes. Well, verse uh, 1 of chapter 16, another situation. Samson went to Gaza and there he saw a prostitute and he went in to her. And Chapter 16, verse 4, it says, After this, he loved a woman in the valley of Sorak, whose name was Delilah. When you heard the name Delilah, for those who are familiar with the story, you see, this is leading Samson toward the end of his life. A mighty judge. And for his whole life, he's pursuing romance, love, marriage, and sex. And yet, he missed the opportunity to be used even more mightily. He missed the will of God. So sad. So, as we look into this counterfeit shelter of romance, love, marriage, and sex, first, We've already said that we, they, these are created by God for us to enjoy. But then we have to realize that we better don't make these our ultimate goal. Don't think that, oh, you know, I pursue this. This can satisfy me. That's why I want it and I want it now. Today, you know, if you're single, you may have many dreams and then you're waiting for the right one. Um, this... Uh, right person to fall in love with, to um, get married, to raise a family. Or maybe you are already dating or or married and you are enjoying or maybe some enduring your marriage. Yeah, we know that yes, um, it is created for us to enjoy and also we need to pursue a better marriage. But never make that as your ultimate goal. And maybe you say, you know, how can I balance it Um, so that I will pursue a better relationship with my spouse? I will pursue and enjoy what God has created, but yet not to the point that I would take that as my ultimate goal to go after. If you read Genesis chapter 3, verse 6, it's talking about, if you remember, Um, Adam and Eve, they were tempted, and in fact, Eve was tempted, and then somehow he gave the fruits to uh, Adam. Verse 6 of chapter 3, it says, So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took off its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. What's the point of the story? The story is that, oh, like Eve was tempted and then somehow she gave in, she ate the fruits. Uh, But yet, she thought that it was good. 
and uh, it's delight to the eye and then the, it was uh, to be desired to make one wise that's why she thought oh this is something good i'm going to give it to my husband is it good to share well in fact it is good to share and if you read chapter 3 verse 12 the man said you know when god said hey what happened how come and adam answered the woman whom you gave to be with me she gave me fruits of the tree and i ate so you see god you gave this woman to me and she gave this fruit to me and i ate it is good is it good for the husband to enjoy what the wife has provided of course you know like you know just try it you know, if your wife cook a meal and then offer it to you and say no i don't want to eat it no of course you want to eat it of course you want to please your wife of course like you enjoy the food that she's giving you and in fact when she share it's out of love and when you eat and take it's out of love is it good that the husband loved the wife is it good that the wife loved the husband and share yes but one thing was missing they did not put god in the picture like god says do not eat so do not eat and even i ate it i shouldn't have given it to my husband because it violates god's will and likewise even though my wife tell me okay eat it but if it doesn't please god i should not have eaten it just like Samson, like chapter 14 of the book of Judges, verse 3, it says, But his father and mother said to him, Is there not a woman among the daughters of your relatives or among all our people that you must go to take a wife from the uncircumcised Philistines? And then Samson said to his father, Get her for me. For she is right in my eyes yes he desired it and he wanted he wanted now i think that's a very good principle it's called delay gratification yes you want it it fills your desire yeah uh, but yet delay gratification is you don't have to have it right now it gives you time to reflect it gives you time to see whether this is really something that you need, that you should take. And in fact, Samson is doing the same thing that you know, I want it, just like Adam and Eve. You know, I want it, I, I have it. But yet, God has given them, the Israelite, the law of not marrying with the Gentiles. But yet, Samson, ignore it. I don't care what God says, but I want it. I think what lesson that we could learn here is that we need to wait and be careful and to examine what is the will of God, especially like young people when you need to uh, go date and find a girlfriend or a boyfriend and see whether it is God's will to put you together. Delay gratification, especially when we talk about sex. Sex is good and enjoyable only within marriage. And delay gratification, wait upon the Lord and see whether this person is God's will to put in your life. Whether you and this person have the same belief, have the same life goal. Well, you now we can wait till when we have the dating workshop to go into further but now i would like to bring you uh, and point you to a person who reacted right and not just oh you know i i fall in love and then i i, I listen to everything that my spouse says i want you to turn to job chapter 2 verse 9 to 10. probably most of us have heard of the story of job he suffered because Satan attacked him, attacked him. And, uh, and even to a point that his wife is telling him, 
that, hey, forget it, curse God and die. If you read Job, uh, the book of Job, chapter 2, verse 9 to 10, and it says, Then his wife said to him, Do you still hold fast your integrity? Curse God and die. But he said to her, You speak as one of the foolish women would speak. Shall we receive good from God and shall we not receive evil? What it says here is, even Job's wife is telling him, hey, like, look at you. Look, look what, what God has done to you and curse God and die and forget about God. Why do you still hold fast unto your integrity? Why do you still believe in this God who didn't seem to take care of you? Job did not say, oh yeah, you're right, yes. But Job said, Hey, you speak as one of the foolish women. You know, when this person, even my closest mate, is not telling me something that aligns with God's principle, then we should not listen. And maybe some will say, hey, how rude is Job? Just like he said that his wife is a foolish woman. But I want you to look at how Job phrase himself. It says, you speak as one of the foolish women. She's not saying, hey, you fool. Hey, you foolish woman. No, you, you are not a foolish woman. But how come you speak as one of these foolish women? And also, if you understand the word foolish or fool, especially I want you to turn to Psalms, 14, 1 and 53, 1. Um, two Psalms, but pretty much like identical. It says here, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. What does it mean? What is a fool? What is a foolish woman? It's one who do not put God as the God of his life or her life. And what it says is, don't be foolish. You know, don't talk about things like that. Don't leave home without God. God should always be with you and God's principle should always be your principle. So don't tell me. Don't speak like a foolish woman. Don't tell me to leave and curse God. Romance, love, marriage, sex, they are created by God for us to enjoy. And don't make these things as our ultimate goal. But one more important point is that we should not treat these as more important than God. In fact, don't treat anything as more important than God, whether it's your academic pursuit, whether it's your romance or love or marriage or children or family or your career, or money, like we said last time. None of these things should be more important than God. Just like Psalm 73, verse 25, it says, Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. I want you to pluck yourself in this psalm. Imagine and ask the question, besides God, besides you, what on earth do I desire? Of course, there are many things that we desire, but don't put these things above God. Remember when after Jesus was raised from the dead and he appeared to the disciples, um, he even cooked breakfast for the disciples and after that um, he and Peter have a stroll on the beach and that's the time recorded in John chapter 21 verse 15 to 17 that Jesus said to Simon Peter and he said Simon son of John do you love me more than these of course people are speculating what are these these could be the fish that they caught. This could be the career 
as a fisherman of Peter. These could be like the, the other disciples. Do you love me more than these disciples so love me? But no matter what, uh, no matter how you take the these, the point is, do not love anything else more than you love me. And this is phrased in a question form. Do you love me more than anything else? And not only one time, but the second time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And then the third time, Jesus said to Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me? I want you to read it from another perspective. Trying to pluck yourself into the situation. Imagine you and Jesus, you are walking on the beach. And as you're walking, seeing the sunrise, the wave rush upon the shore, and Jesus asks you, Do you love me more than these? And I want you to read this verse from this perspective, saying, Jesus said to me, and then put in your name, Walter, do you love me more than these? I want you to quiet down for a moment and maybe repeat it. If you're home alone, then you can say it out loud. But if you're home with your family members, say it in your own heart. Jesus said to me, do you love me more than this? Pluck your name in and say it. Walter, do you love me more than this? Kevin, do you love me more than this? Kai, do you love me more than this? Jonathan, do you love me more than this? Take a moment, say a few times in your heart. When we talk about counterfeit shelters, romance, love, marriage, sex, these are created by God for us to enjoy, but yet don't make this our ultimate goal and don't treat this as more important than God. And finally, let God be the love of your life. Let God be the love of your life. Do you love me more than these. Every first Sunday of the month, instead of communion, we have meditation on the cross. And at this time, I would like you to think of what Jesus Christ has done for you on the cross, how he suffered, how he sacrificed himself, how he was nailed on the cross, how he was abandoned by people, and yet, even God the Father, at one point, didn't seem to look at him eye to eye. And just imagine Jesus has given us so much for the purpose of making us his own. And the Father has sacrificed so much, even the Son of the life of his only begotten son for the purpose that we could call him Abba Father and he could consider us as children. So let's take some time and think about what God has done for us and in what way then we can respond to him. I would like you to reflect and see what in your life would prevent you from making God the love of your life? And in what way you could reprioritize your life to put God first? Of course, if there are any obstacle, anything that would prevent you from making God the love of your life, these things must be very important. Do you love me more than these? These probably are important things in your life, whether it's your family members, whether it's your relationship, whether it's your career, 
or whether it's the possession or the enjoyment or the entertainment, whatever it is, you must have treated those as important. So in what way you can prioritize your life so that these important things, yes, you enjoy, you pursue after them, those are important, those really means a lot to you. But yet, how can I not allow these things to prevent us from making God the love of our lives? And how can we and how can you reprioritize these things so that you could put God first? How about let's take some time, maybe a minute or so, to meditate on it. But also, even after leaving this worship, um, do not forget about this question and ponder upon yourself for the rest of the week in what way that you can reprioritize your life so that God could be the love of your life and could be on top of your priority list. Let's pray. Let's take some time to meditate yourself first. Father, thank you. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for sending Jesus to die for us on the cross so that we could be adopted as children. And Father, at this time, we believe that you have heard our prayers. We believe that you know our struggles. And Father, we just pray that you continue to guide us and lead us so that we could reprioritize our life and put you first as our first love, as the love of our life, and love you more than anything else. And Father, thank you again for this opportunity that we can reflect and see that romance, love, marriage, sex, those are good if it is being enjoyed within and under your will. And may you continue to remind us good things, but yet could not replace you and be the shelter of our lives. And Father, thank you, and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.
one else can touch my heart like you do I can search for all eternity long And find there is none like like to welcome all of you to worship with us online and if you're a newcomer uh, please go on to our website or click the link uh, under the, uh, the YouTube uh, and then uh, get onto our website so that uh, we can get into contact with one another uh, one announcement is that we have session actions and uh, the session has approved uh, the plan in principle to upgrade the bathroom facilities of the San Francisco and the Daly City campuses in order to improve general hygiene and preparation for the reopening of the church. And also, the session has approved the baptism and transfer candidates from both the San Francisco and the Daly City campuses. And another announcement is on the elder election. Uh, Janet Sun is the elder candidate this year and our church members will be able to express their opinion online. Please use this QR code to go to the church website to vote. And today, remember, is the last day to submit your vote. And also, we have another survey, is the reopening survey. The church reopening team would like to survey our congregations to find out their comfort level about coming to in-person worship services. And please fill out the reopening survey form on the church website or use this QR code. And uh, remember, this is the first phase of our reopening. And the first phase is a time that we uh, will not provide any children program, nursery. So keep that in mind as you fill out the survey form. Also, we have the second to last Bible Connect. And it will be on Tuesday, um, May 4th at 8 o'clock. So let's connect with one another, uh, with God and with His Word as we explore Psalm 119 together. And the Zoom information will be in the weekly emails. Or email Pastor Tim, tdy223 at gmail.com. Well, next week is uh, May 9th and it's Mother's Day. And we have a Mother's Day worship, so please invite your mother and grandmother to join us for the online worship services. Uh, last but not least, uh, we have a memorial service for Elder Alan Wong. And there will be a memorial service for Elder Alan Wong on May 15 at 3 p.m. A detail for the link to stream the service is forthcoming. Okay, let's uh, close the worship in a word of prayer. Let's bow and pray. And Father, thank you for this time that we can look into various um, counterfeit shelters. And Father, a lot of times we find protection under these counterfeit shelters, thinking that they are the real thing. But Father, Father we know that besides you, there's no real thing. Besides you, there's no real shelter. And besides you, there's no real goal of life. And Father, continue to encourage us, help us, uh, especially during this not so easy time of our life. And Father, help us to shelter in you and also regain our power and energy from you that we can start soaring on high. And Father, thank you. Be with us. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, I'd like to see you next week. And may God bless you. Bye-bye.